Hi, it's Chris Lingenfelter from Robot Advisors. We have a series that we're calling Argon Insights. Thanks to the folks at Argon & Co., I sit down with each of the supply chain leaders at Argon, and we talk about the interesting things that are happening in supply chain, useful information that you as a practitioner can use. So please enjoy the series. It's Chris Lingenfelter from Robot Advisors, and I'm here with Steve Malike for our second two. Yeah, uh, number two. Argon Insights chat, um, where we talk about interesting topical things for warehouse and supply chain uh, logistics professionals. And today we're gonna talk about peak readiness. We're here um, in October, believe it or not, and peak for- We're in Memphis too, and Memphis is like one of the capital places for uh, e-commerce companies to operate. A lot of retail and e-commerce. FedEx, FedEx is with here. The world it's ports easy to ship stuff. Here. Yep. yep, absolutely. So, um, so well, let's just jump right into it. Um, but I do want to give a little plug for um, Argon, who sponsors our Argon Insights, uh, your employer. Um, <laughs> I appreciate what, that. 750 folks all Worldwide, around the world. Worldwide, 18 offices everywhere from down in the corner in Sydney and Auckland, New Zealand, all the way up to Chicago and stuff, all covering Europe as well. We have people on every continent except for Africa. It's peak. I've got a warehouse. I'm going, well, you know, I'm hearing from merchandising. We're going to hit 22% more orders this year than we did last yeah. year. I'm going, I hope they're wrong. I hope they're wrong. But yeah. i got to be ready if, in case I, they're I not. Tell so you, how do I, how do I, I make sure? I've done a lot of work over the years in, in warehousing, designing them, as well as helping people with the systems. But I think more recently, I've gotten involved with a lot of I'm going to say kind of warehouse turnarounds where somebody's kind of really struggling to, to get everything out. And I can tell you a lot of those don't pop up until you get to peak. And so it's important. I, I think if I look back on all the, I had like 15 or 16 of these projects. If you think about why that happens, there, there's, there's like four or five factors that really influence somebody's capacity. And you need to check those before you go into peak. So, so let's let's hit those. What are those? those yeah, factors? yeah. So, so um, one is is your inbound capacity. Can you really bring in the stuff that you think you're going to need uh, in, in, in the time frame that it's going to show up? Second one is well, once it gets in the building, do I have enough room to store it? Remember, warehouses are kind of like grocery stores. You got the back room and you got the shelving. Well, you got to make sure you have enough room in the back room to hold all this stuff before you put it on the shelves. And I think sometimes as people are growing very, very rapidly, they don't realize how much capacity they may need in the back to store things. Then you have to talk about what's actually, how much room do you have or what we call pick locations on the shelf for, to, to actually sell products. So if you're an internet company, like you might be in, in, in Memphis, you may have 20,000 SKUs that are for sale on the internet. Well, you need to probably have 20,000 pick locations to, to do that with. And ideally, the right size, I would imagine. That's, oh, that's a really good point, because a lot of people don't think about how important it is to have, if for your really popular items, to have a big location, right? Because you don't want to be constantly replenishing that throughout the day. So if I'm a warehouse manager, I'm thinking about, do I have enough storage space? Do I have enough pick locations? Do I have enough pick locations of the right size? And do I have products that are sitting in them? And then ultimately, you also have to worry about your conveyor and material handling equipment. Can it keep up? Uh, with, so, so those are the five things I would be thinking about and saying, okay, when we get into peak, and you may have a different inbound peak from an outbound peak, so you got to think about that angle too, but when I get into peak, whether it's inbound or outbound, do I, am I going to be okay? Am I going to have enough storage space, enough pick locations, et cetera? And That's what about, I imagine, you know, I mean, some folks, especially like in toys or gift items that just explode in the holiday yeah, season, they're the, you're talking about eight to one, 10 to one peak to me. Absolutely. I imagine you're bringing in additional people. That, oh, that's, that, and that's also something. I think that everybody will be focused on getting, if this is you know, October as it is here, everybody's already really hardcore recruiting folks. The mistake I think I see a lot of times in these, these warehouses that go astray is they hire plenty of people to pick things and pack things and replenish things and receive things. What they don't do is think about scaling the people that deal with exceptions. Mm. You know, there's, there's got to, it's not like people during peak make less mistakes than they do during the normal. Even the best pickers are under they make pressure more. and I mean, they make people more. in so, your way. So if and, you're going to yeah. need 50% more pickers, you need 50% more people that are out there correcting inventory problems that occur during peak. Otherwise, you end up shipping stuff short and disappointing customers. And I think that's, that's, that would be my kind of suggestion. If I was running a warehouse, I'm not just worried about 
do I get enough pickers? I also want to think about how am I going to get enough people to say deal with short picks or to deal chase missing cases. The hospital lane. You, the hospitals, you, you got the order hospitals, right? All those things need to be staffed adequately to. And and that's a plan. higher level skill than just going and picking something. Yeah, and right? that's what makes it hard. I think sometimes the best way to answer that challenge is to take people that maybe during the regular part of the year they may have kind of a a less cognitively taxing job, <laughs> like like being a picker or being a packer. But then during peak, you say, listen, you need to step up. You need to do our inventory adjustments. You need to be able to deal with short picks. You need to be able to run the order hospital. And I, I think, you know, people enjoy that. They, they actually look forward to peak because they're going to be doing a little bit more. And else, there's a little bit more prestige with that. So that's that's I've seen that as a successful strategy for how to address that. Could you, if, if, if you were operating in a warehouse, could you kind of have a, a fake trial run peak where you hold some orders back and, or, or just try to get it a day's worth out in, in a couple hours just to try yeah, to exercise yeah. that muscle? You know, it's, it's, that's funny you say that because I mean, that's, we actually call that something, we call it a game day. I mean, and, uh -huh. and, and I can't take credit for inventing that. We actually, one of our clients, a very large retailer, does that regularly to kind of test do they really have all those things covered? Pick locations, storage locations, receiving doc, material handling equipment. Are all those things going to work once the volumes crank up? And so what they'll do is they'll hold back, say, a bunch of orders, and they'll, they'll bring in their second shift um, early, and they'll make, our, make their first shift start late so they have tons of extra people. And they'll run eh, two to five, six hours, maybe even a full shift if they can get people to stick around to demonstrate that they can produce orders and pick stuff and get it shipped on time at peak like volumes. And they call it a game day. And it's a great way to validate that you've done your peak homework and that mm. you've checked mm. off all the boxes and that it really will work and you won't be stuck. And if you have a significant peak, you probably should have Lock down your systems and your processes a few weeks ago, and you're not yeah. not putting in a, a, a you know new version of any operating system or yeah. software. Or yeah, anything you know like. that's that's another one. that's that's burned more than a couple of warehouse managers over the years. Yeah, they definitely for, as part of your peak readiness, you should have an IT plan that says, okay, we are not going to put in any changes after a certain date. And usually, it's when the the inbound stuff starts coming in. Because you don't, you just can't put anything in. Now there has to be some kind of weird exceptions, like sometimes it's reports or something like that that's allowed to. But any kind of thing that influences the actual code, you, you just—it's just a silly thing. You're just putting yourself at risk yep. for no reason. Yep. Only the real emergency code fixes that, yeah, that I, have, have, they're required. I, I think that's the only time I've ever seen anybody do that. But, it, but generally, no one is going to entertain kind of. Nice to have changes, say, in October or November, because that just is way too dangerous. That's a standard procedure, I think, with most people. Any other uh, peak advice for folks? I, I think what I would call out is, is if I'm running a warehouse and I've checked out all those things and I've been careful about trying to get enough people, I would say that frequently people that get brought in for peak get educated in a very kind of ineffective way. They call it on-the-job on training. They usually, if you're a new guy, temporary coming into work, you're going to work with Bob the picker who's, yeah, he's great. He may have been here for a while, but he's also got a lot of bad habits. That, and that I don't think a lot of times the management teams realize how bad habits kind of propagate through all these new people that you bring in mm. because Bob is training them. And Bob doesn't necessarily know all the best things to do. So I really recommend spending a little bit of time to come up with some formal training. And not, not about, but I call it button pushing. It's not about button pushing. Um, you need to teach somebody how to pick. And what does that mean? Well, I mean, there's things, uh, I, I once got a bunch of pickers in a room and I, there was a bunch of very, uh, I would say, uh, mature uh, ladies that pick there and pick full time, kind of my age. And there was all these young bucks that had shown up. And I said, okay, who do you think walks the most every night? to pick their orders. <coughs> and I had done something very shrewdly. I'd put a, a Fitbit on the little old ladies that worked there, and I put some Fitbits on the kids that also had shown up. They thought they were so cool and knew how to run around fast. And, you know, of course, the, the <laughs> everybody started making fun of the old ladies saying they don't know what they're doing. They, they take, they take, they and I, I, count, I calculated how many orders they picked, how many feet they walked. And the people, those little old ladies, walked like 30% less. But got more out. And got more out. Yep. And I said, how do you think they do that? 
And, and I, I, does everybody, well, first of all, I also asked, does anybody want to walk an extra 30% every night? <laughs> of course, there was Take no hand. Take laps Nobody around the building hand, before but, you go home. <laughs> but I, I think, that, you know, it, it came down to, they, they were very shrewd about how, what orders they, they gathered together on their carts, how they approached the pick path. They didn't walk extra, um, back, they didn't backtrack. They, they were very smart about how they routed themselves. Um, th th those things you can teach people. You can teach the new people too. And if, if you can kind of position it with this idea that, you know, it's about you not necessarily getting out more, but you feeling better at the end of the night. Yeah. If you've only, if you walked 30% less or you've had to, to reach 30% less or something because you're being efficient with your body motions. I, I don't think a lot of people spend the time to train new people in that way. I don't know if our, our viewers are aware of this, but I think you pioneered, and I, and I believe you still do this today, you videotape the pickers and study who are the best yeah. using some, some great yeah. software and a little bit of muscle looking through yeah, all we, these Yeah, we videos. call that crowd engineering. We, we shoot video of different operators and then we kind of feed it into some software we have that kind of compares them and then pulls out the best people at, at little small parts of a job, like who's best at sealing a box? You know, we could say, well, you do it at 2.7 seconds and I do it at eight. Well, what makes you, why, why are you so much better? Well, I mean, you can see, the software will kind of narrow in on these people that are really great and you find out, okay, this is what they do. And then you teach to everybody. So I-, I Well, and there could be parts of the job that you do faster than I do. And by- That's absolutely true. By cross-training to the best practice, we, we both, you know, the whole, the, the tide raises all the pickers, Absolutely, right? I, and I could talk all day about things that I've discovered through this process. I mean, there, there's, Miss Sue was this lady, I'll never forget that, learned out a way how to, how to stamp or, or mark boxes that were uh, next day orders faster than everybody else by bringing in her bingo stamp for home. I mean, there's, <laughs> <laughs> but there's lots of weird stories like that where you discover how people that do things thousands and thousands of times a day, they innovate. Everybody does. I don't care how dumb you are or how brilliant you are, everybody is impatient with doing it the same way over and over. So they will make, they will make natural kind of evolutions in how they do the job. And if you can learn all those things and teach them to everybody, then everybody can be better. I think we should have an Argon Insights we could, we could just absolutely, on we could, we labor could, we could and talk for, best yeah, practices. Absolutely. We're, absolutely. We're, this is about peak. Um, and, uh, you know, folks, you heard it here. If, if, you, if you're staring down peak, have a game day, even a mini game day, yeah. and, and, and stretch that muscle. And check out all your, your, your five factors to make sure you've got enough storage space, inbound, pick locations, et cetera. That's exactly, important. exactly. And make sure, you know, you've, you've exercised that muscle before, uh, before Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So, Steve, thank you for the, well, thank uh, you. the second Argonne Insights. Um, we've got another one uh, here coming up in about a week. Steve, I want to thank you for our second Argonne Insights. And of course, thank you to Argonne & Co. for, for sponsoring our, our Insights series. And uh, we're releasing these every week on Mondays. So uh, please tune in for the next one here on, on LinkedIn or wherever you hear us. And uh, Steve, thanks a lot. Hey, thank you, Chris. Really enjoyed it.